the data platform engineer at Stitch Fix. And I will be speaking about enabling full stack data scientists. So I'll give you a little rundown of what my, my sorry, I'm afraid to echo this. Okay. Uh, okay, so I'll give you a little rundown of what I'll be talking about today. Um, first, I'll talk a bit about what we do. So what Stitch Fix as a company actually does, give you some context as to what the data scientists there do, and then the, thus what the data platform engineers supporting the data scientists do. I'll then talk a bit about how we operate, and uh, particularly the algorithms and analytics team, which encapsulates data platform and data scientists. And then I'll speak about what it is that this platform does, and how we try to serve the data scientists that we support. And I call this transforming the way data scientists do what they love, which is almost a joke that will make sense in the previous lives. So, what do you do? Uh, we have a business where we sell clothing, and then we actually focus a lot on the customer experiences, and that sort of informs the data that we end up having. So, we sell all types of clothing. We have men's clothing, we have women's clothing, we have maternity clothing, uh, plus size clothing. Those are, yes, those are all our business lines. And so what this means when I say that we sell clothing and somehow we use a lot of technology is that what we're trying to do is a really intense form of personalization. What people wear is extremely personal and it tends to be a way a lot of people express themselves or alternatively don't. I have lots of friends that wear all black and they like wearing all black because they want to just not make any decisions. Um, when I was getting dressed today, I was thinking about audience here, what it is they wanted to express. Uh, for example, this talk I actually gave on Friday as well at Facebook's Women in Analytics Conference in the Data Platform track. And there I was like, oh, I'm going to be presenting to this really large group of amazing women that do data science and analytics and data engineering. I think with this group I can be a little fancier and a little edgier. <laughs> Thinking about this audience here, it's like, you know what, pretty casual, pretty laid back, probably t-shirt and jeans kind of place. But when I present, I kind of like to go pretty hard on the feminine side because I can, why not? <laughs> and uh, I feel like I successfully accomplished what I wanted in my outfit today because one of my coworkers saw me and was like, wow, you look ready to run through a field of flowers, which is exactly what I was going for. And so <laughs> people really, I mean, I do certainly think about clothing in terms of self-expression. And so doing personalization for clothing is something that tends to be personal, as personalization might imply, <laughs> but also very emotional. And so what this looks like when we do personalization for a person that is cut, that is made an order on Stitch Fix is that they go to our website and they sign up. Part of signing up is filling out a survey. So the survey has information about basic things like your size, your age, also about your preferences in clothing, preferences in material, preferences in colors and patterns. And we use this information then, after you say, send me a fix, uh, to give to a personal stylist. This personal stylist picks out clothing for you. This clothing goes into a box that gets mailed to you. You try it on at home, you keep what you like, you mail back what you don't, and you check out online, giving us feedback on what it is that you do or do not like about those items. So in our men's line, for example, we collect a ton of information about fit. And there's actually a lot more than Stitch Fix does other than clothing personalization or parts of our business. So a really interesting example is that when you give us information about fit in our men's clothing, a huge amount of our men's clothing business is exclusive brands, which means we make that clothing ourselves. So we have this, this feedback loop of we make some clothing with certain materials and certain cuts, certain styles, colors. We try to sell it to people. We see if they want to buy it. And if they don't, we try to collect granular feedback on what works or doesn't. And what we found when we originally launched our men's line is that we're, our cuts were too boxy. So not everyone appreciated how our shirts were cut and wanted a silver fit. Things like that give us a lot of information to then go back and correct the clothing that we're actually making and selling. And the changes that we make tend to be very positive on our sales. So there's a ton of different ways that data and using data fits into this business model. So we sell clothing, we have to buy clothing, we have to buy clothing six months in advance. 
ability to predict how much we're going to sell and at a very quickly growing company. If you look at our revenue numbers over the last few years, it's huge changes. Uh, at a very quickly growing company, being able to accurately predict how much we think we're going to sell is difficult and split that amongst business lines. And beyond that, split that amongst sizes and styles and what sort of items we need. <coughs> so we have a lot of data scientists that work on a variety of problems. So let me describe to you how it is to organize all these data scientists to solve some of these problems. As I mentioned, data science is part of the algorithm and is part of algorithm and analytics as an organization. We have a C-level executive that reports to Katrina Lake. His name's Eric Coulson. He's called our chief algorithms officer. And underneath him, there are two sections of algorithms and analytics. One is what you would expect, data scientists. So we have in the data science category, data scientists are organized by vertical, I would describe it. So we have data scientists working on styling. So most people, when they think of data science and stitch fix, they're like, oh yes, of course. They need to recommend items to people. True, we need to recommend items to people. But beyond that, we actually have an internal application that we show to our personal stylists. And the personal stylist will use this information shown in the recommendations and have different algorithms running that, that show up of what people might like or not like. But beyond that, we also want to sort of experiment on stylist behavior. What information should we show stylists so that they make the best decisions? How do we organize it? What does the page look like? We have operations. So we buy clothing and we send it to people in the mail which means that we have warehouses that we need to store this clothing and mail it out of. And this is, I actually think, is probably one of our most fascinating problems, is doing really efficient operations with the amount of clothing that we have and the warehouses that we have. Um, when you join Stitch Fix, on the second day in the morning, you get to tour a warehouse and see how a fix happens inside of the warehouse. And I have never seen an assault attached map implemented uh, in real life, but it is totally fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have the client team, which is all about accumulating new clients, making sure we have clients in the long term. And we have this horizontal data science team, which I think is which is new and I think a very interesting team. And I will speak a bit about that later because we have this interesting sub-team, which I think fills a gap uh, that has come about because of the way we've decided to organize projects inside of data science, which is a lot of what I'll be talking about here. So got a bunch of data scientists doing all different kinds of work, different verticals, styling, ops, client, but at all of these verticals have overlapping parts of the business and they need to be able to communicate and collaborate with one another. Then we have data platform connect hanging off to the side. This is the team that I'm on, and we basically try to figure out how to help these data scientists as much as possible. But what that means really has to be thought of in the context of how we structure our projects and how we motivate people that are, are working on these projects. So one of the things I really, really enjoy about working at Stitch Fix is that we have a huge emphasis on autonomy and ownership of projects, where Particularly with, a, particularly with our data scientists, we want them to own a project end to end. It's their responsibility to partner with their business partners. So if they're working in styling, styling leadership, if they're working in merchandise planning, working with the buyers in merchandise, figure out the requirements for a project, figure out how they can help, <coughs> figure out what the interface between them and the business looks like, and to build a model and iterate on it any way they need to. So the downstream impact of that on the way data platform functions is first, we don't write ETL for the data scientists. There's a pretty popular blog post that uh, Jay Mag Jeff Magnuson wrote. Has anyone here read Engineers Should Not Write ETL? Yeah, so I see like a quarter of the room. Uh, and it's, I think, a completely fascinating blog post in which he emphasizes data scientists feeling ownership over their projects, but also a structure in which engineers that are building tools for data scientists don't feel like they have no creative output or no creative outlet in their work 
for them to, so when data engineers are working just on building pipelines and handing them off to someone else, you kind of lose autonomy, right? And you have, you have this friction of having made decisions about what happens to the data along the way, and then you give it to a data scientist to do the fun stuff with. And I get it, you know, I've worked both sides of being a data engineer and doing mathematical modeling and data science work. And I think the mathematical mod modeling part is really creative and fun, but I also think that to do it accurately, you really need to have a good handle on what happened to the data along the way. And so I, I appreciate this ownership model where data scientists are meant to own things they build end to end. So let's compare this to what we see in other companies. A typical data science department has a few components. There's obviously data scientists. There are data engineers that are building the pipelines and making sure that data goes from some uh, working formats so and maybe from the database systems that are supporting an application into a data warehouse, and then building derived tables off of that. There's data scientists that are building their models and trying to optimize some sort of process. And then there's software engineers that take these models and deploy them. And at the bottom of that are data infrastructure engineers to make sure all the systems kind of continue to be alive and continue to work. Um, as Dan mentioned, I worked at Cloudera for a while, and one of the things that I did there was I would consult with our really big Fortune 500 international huge companies about their data science teams, how they're working, how they're organized, and frequently go in there and you ask, so what's going well, what's going wrong, tell me all about how things are working here. And a really, really common pattern that resulted in big complaints was this process of handoff between data scientists and people deploying models. So often what I would see is a data scientist would build an extremely accurate, extremely convoluted model. They would then go to a software engineering team and say, okay, it's done, it's ready, here you go. Just go, you know, put it in production, whatever that means. These software engineers would get this model. Perhaps it is not the best commented. Perhaps it is not the best documented. And it would take months to get a model from something that was written in Python or R, rewritten into some language that is part of the production serving system. This is pretty painful. This is something that becomes pretty obvious to executives that are watching this system. You know, why is it taking so long to get our new system up? So there's an alternative way to think about what's happening. We're taking all of these different types of roles. So they're trying to make a new recommendation system, for example, or a new recommendation model. All of these roles have to work together to provide this one data-driven capability. And I go and talk to an executive and I say, well, I know that I said I would deliver this capability to the business new recommendation system in three months. Why did it take nine? Why is it still not done? And realistically, they actually have a bunch of capabilities that they would like to be delivering to the business or are responsible for continually delivering to the business. And what ends up being really challenging here is that we get many roles spread across many capabilities, and there's a lot of interaction and coordination that needs to happen between all of them. So this results in a lot of meetings, a lot of people sort of sitting down trying to transfer information between each other. And I think that this is a sign of, if, if this was purely a system that involved no humans, I'd say bad API design. Um, but that, I think this is a challenging aspect of this type of organization. So there's a different way that we can organize. We can think about data-driven capabilities being completely owned and driven by data scientists, which is what we do at Stitch Fix. So what we have is a bunch of different capabilities that we want to provide the business. So this could be in client, this could be in merchandising, this could be in our science team. And we have data scientists or teams of data scientists own these capabilities end to end, from the data, data processing to the deployment of the models. So they need to own the implementation of the models. This might be an ETL pipeline that needs to run regularly, plus a service that consumes that end of that data. They own coordination with the business, which amounts to sort of product management skills, and production support, you know, asterisk, sort of. 
So that's great. It's gonna make data scientists do everything. And uh, where did the engineers go? All right, I still have a job. So what what do I do? And what does everyone on the data platform team do? Well, data scientists end up specializing by the thing that they're gonna provide the business. They're gonna provide up into a new recommendation algorithms to be consumed by our side of the application. Data platform engineers, we tend to specialize by function, by the types of services and utilities we're gonna provide data scientists. <coughs> um, so we build an infrastructure. What kind of infrastructure is really useful for us here? I like to think of data scientists as black boxes, right? You put data in, <laughs> dashboards and services come out. <laughs> so I will try to break down this workflow, very detailed workflow, <laughs> uh, into what sort of services we currently provide. And I'll do my best to focus on things that exist and are fully functioning in production, with the one caveat that I'm gonna talk about a thing that I think is really interesting, it's one of my pet projects that's in staging right now, and I like floating this idea out there to hear what people think about it, people are interested in. So, we need to transport data, right? I said that the algorithms department has a C-level executive, Eric. Um, this is fascinating because we also have this engineering team, right? They're the ones producing the data and measurements about our customers, certainly, about operations in our warehouse, certainly. And we need to actually get the data from them. So in this in this data transport box, we consume data from engineering. Things like nightly snapshots of their databases. Uh, we also keep a Kafka queue up, which Liz, shout out to Liz in the back. <laughs> uh, she's an amazing platform engineer at Stitch Fix, and she has gotten everyone to move to Kafka as a, as a way to have the algorithms team consume messages off of our engineering team's rabbit MQ queue. Ra rabbit MQ, oh, yeah. <laughs> I didn't think that one through. Rabbit MQ queue, great. <laughs> uh, so we have ways of capturing data from engineering, landing them into core tables that data scientists then consume. So a lot of the ETL jobs that data scientists own, they're not truly owning them end to end, right? They're not grabbing the data from engineering. It's our responsibility to make sure that this data ends up in a place that data scientists workflows can then rely on. So there's quite a few ETLs that say, once this nightly snapshot lands, run this workflow. So great data scientists have data available to them. And then they do this like magical black box thing, right? And I would like to think that they spend all of their time, you know, dreaming and writing on chalkboard. Realistically, there is a lot more nitty gritty that needs to happen. So by nitty gritty, I of course mean ETL. Data munging, uh, every data scientist's favorite complaint, right? <coughs> oh, that's great ideas, and now I need to actually go make computers implement them. So in order for us to allow data scientists to really reliably define ETL jobs and run them, particularly our infrastructure, we had to build some tooling around that. And when I say our infrastructure, I of course mean AWS. Uh, who here uses AWS? Yeah, yeah. I am just blown away by how many, how much infrastructure has shifted onto AWS. So we don't just say, hey, data scientists, here's, a, here's an account. We'll set up the billing, go have fun, right? Um, this would be, a, I think, an unpleasant experience for most data scientists. So what we've done instead is try to provide some nicer interfaces, particularly around the Elastic Container Service for defining where jobs are going to run and what environments they run in. Um, so, we have two systems. We have one called Flotilla, which this is not the logo for Flotilla. Flotilla does not have a logo, but sailboats are nice. Um, Flotilla a lot is really um, a nice interface for ECS, and it allows our data scientists to go to a web UI, specify what command they want to run once their container launches and job starts, specify what 
image they want to use, and that's what dependencies need to be available in their environment. A fair number of our data scientists have models that require pretty, I'd call them heavy duty libraries, that if you installed them every time, that would be quite a pain. So we needed to provide also some sort of tooling to allow data scientists to define images that have the libraries that they needed baked in. And so that is called Perl. Perl is a way to, in a Git repo, define what define some files and some libraries that you need to install, and then from that be able to build AMIs, Docker images, and RPMs. So relatively, relatively low level, hey, I need you to run this thing on ECS. Uh, infrastructure for data scientists, but the tooling itself is actually pretty easy to interface with. And Flotilla, we have open sourced, and I think it's a nice, nice, lovely interface. Um, I'd recommend checking it out. It's called Flotilla OS on GitHub. It looks like this. You can give your Flotilla job a name, you can give it a, a group, you can tell what Docker image you can use, and then specify some commands. There's some more that you can see online, and a blog post written about this. So, I think that's pretty, from a data scientist's point of view, relatively low level. They need to be able to, to use the compute infrastructure and not run their job on their laptops, right? The last thing you want to find out when someone has, has worked there for a while, built a bunch of models, and is about to leave for another job is that all of their ETL pipelines have been running on their laptop, right? So we try to avoid that. <laughs> but there is also another level of thinking about what data scientists are doing inside of this black box and what some of their challenges are. I don't think the only challenge is how do you run this container on ECS? How do you make sure data scientists are able to do that? Um, I think that it's really, really hard <laughs> to make data, data science reproducible, collaborative, and accurate. And I, again, I get the opportunity to work with such great people. Uh, I work with Hilary Parker, and she works on the style in the styling organization. And she wrote a great paper and gave a series of talks about opinionated analysis development. And so it's very much focused around how does an individual data scientist use tools and integrate that, those tools into their workflow to make more reproducible, accurate, and collaborative analyses. And I think that this is an excellent thing to think about and a very challenging problem. But from my point of view, I want to think about it from the perspective of platform engineer. So how, how can a platform provide tools to data scientists to make their work more reproducible, accurate, and collaborative? Well, beginning to unwind what people are doing inside of that black box, kind of. Uh, I think that people are making artifacts. So a data scientist needs to do some work. This is an ETL pipeline. So it might need to be multiple flotilla jobs switched together, or a SQL query followed by some Spark. And what comes out at the end are models or data. And these artifacts, it would be wonderful if we had a way to think about versioning them. So you can imagine that, uh, I'm now looking at the slides and wishing that I had these key to make you know, version and not PDF, but I did not think about the export image. But you can imagine that in making new tables and defining these ETLs and having this artifact that is a data output, that we have first a price preference table. So this price preference table, you can imagine that say part of our styling survey is, hey client, how much do you prefer to spend on blouses? A client tells us they prefer to spend $75 on blouses. And then some data scientists down the line has an ETL pipeline that they're responsible for that's supposed to label our clients as high price point or not. So do these people want slightly more expensive things or not? And let's say two months ago, the definition was if it's less than $100, then it's not a high price point. And so we'll record that in some derived table somewhere. Now, let's say we run this again today, and the output says, actually, they are high price point. We see a new client, like the same client ID, now two months in the future, they're now at high price point. It's hard for us to tell and untangle if what happened was the data changed or the definition used to define the new data changed. And so I think that there's 
a lot of opportunity in model building and data process building to think really clearly about versioning and understanding how computation changes over time. And the reason that I become concerned about things like this is that, <coughs> let's say we have all of these individual data scientists working on their projects. They're owning their capability end to end. But let's say that one of their models, it would be really useful to own, to consume in that model the output of another one. Consuming the output of another model, often a great idea, often has useful information captured in it. But if that other model changes in time, and it could change in a variety of ways, some inconsequential, some very consequential, the data, the data scientist that's building this model that's consuming it should have some way of knowing that, and some way of alerting on that change. Even in a less complicated world, you can imagine a dashboard made for C-level executives where a certain number is being reported, and that number suddenly changes. And then they ask why, what happened here? Is this reflecting something fundamental in the business, or is this reflecting some strange artifact of the data? And being able to answer that question and untangle that quickly is extremely hard about thinking about this sort of lineage of how ETLs are changing over time. So this is the pet project currently in staging, not fully formed yet, uh, that is my a, a deep and sincere, sincere interest of mine. <laughs> Um, so if you're interested in talking more about this and how this works, and how to sign this, find me later. I'll be, I mean, later is happy hour, I guess, so find me there. So there are, of course, now that we have these artifacts that data scientists have made, there's other things that they need to do with them. So one of these artifacts is they make dashboards, right? So we do and support really well a few things around making dashboards and employing them in our infrastructure. First, our, I think our tooling around Shiny is really great. It's very easy to you know, use a simple package that one of our great data viz engineers has built to deploy you, your Shiny application. It'll use Packrack to package up all the R dependencies that you need, and then it'll deploy it either to sta staging or to production, depending on where you need it to go. And once it's there, it's visible inside uh, inside of AI, but if you need to make it visible to other groups, so say you're a public company and you need to be SOX compliant, and you need to make sure that only the right people are seeing the right things, we have a tool called the Daylight, which allows us to say, here are the groups of people configured through our, we do an LMAP or one login system, um, by their roles, and who is allowed to see what, and suddenly it's publicly available internally on our network, for people to see the right dashboards that they're allowed to see. Great. When it comes to services, uh, this is, I think, extremely <coughs> interesting because I spent a while explaining that challenge of doing handoff of models between data scientists and engineers. In some situations, that handoff is really, really hard to avoid. So you can imagine doing real-time fraud detection. You probably want an engineer making sure that you can meet the latency requirements of a system like that. If you're trying to do credit card processing or sort of charge processing, you're looking for that. Um, data scientists are perhaps not the right people to be implementing that model in your service if you have really strict latency requirements. Or you're at a huge scale and throughput is something you need to be concerned about. You're, they're probably not the people to design that system. In our situation, most of the services that we provide for automated API consumption are working with our internal tools. So you can imagine our internal styling app. We have recommendations that appear in that. The internal styling app is used by other Citrix employees. Having a little bit of latency, not so bad. Also, there's not a huge number of stylists using this. There's some, but you know, not so many that it even, yeah. It's, the engineering requirements are relatively light, which means we can really provide some useful tools to allow data scientists to build simple servers. So what we end up doing, and what I think every mach production machine learning service needs to do, is provide an environment that a model can run in, provide a deployment mechanism for that server with the right environment, and then also 
allow data access. So you can imagine there's an ETL pipeline that trains a model, parameters get written somewhere. Those parameters need to be made available to the service, and it would be best if the service were able to continually refresh those parameters as they get changed. So let's say you have a nightly job that builds a new model. You don't want to redeploy your service just to get more data. So we need to be able to access the data that results in an ETL job. And then we also need to provide a reasonable API. And by reasonable API, I mean something that's documented, something that can handle the throughput that we have. Um, I, I say that there's not high engineering requirements, but also I think if you let a data scientist build a service on their own, it maybe would not have all of these features. Or if it did, it would be using four copies of Elasticsearch somehow. No shade. <laughs> so we built a system um, called Con. And so Con really allows us to easily fit into our service deployment infrastructure and allow data scientists to write a simple script that is called our run script that specifies endpoints. These endpoints consume JSON, and Con itself is written in Python 3. The JSON that is consumed is matched to the function signature uh, that is associated with that endpoint. And we do things like type checking when you're using uh, type hints in Python 3, and then returns more JSON, and depending on what that JSON is, we can generate automated swagger box for it and share those with our engineering organization so we can integrate APIs that works very smoothly. And the piece that I think is probably the most useful, I think a data scientist, given enough time with the Flask documentation, can build a web server. I think it is significantly harder to cheaply, reliably, easily access data that's constantly being refreshed in ETL pipelines and have it integrate with our service deployment. And so this data movement uh, and <coughs> data accessibility and refreshing <coughs> system uh, ends up being, I think, hugely useful. We do things like building model parameters. We also do things like pre-compute client features so that at recommendation time, for example, you maybe don't want to go back in history and do all the right joints to figure out what a person's client feature vector should look like. And so we will pre-generate them, load them into a data source for data access, uh, and try to make this as simple as possible. We have a pretty short tutorial, and data scientists love tutorial, and we use that. Beyond that, of course, we have monitoring, logging, pager duty, uh, all things that may or may not exist in a data scientist's first implementation if we didn't set it up for them already. And this ends up being extremely valuable and useful uh, in order to make sure engineering thinks that we're a reliable team and that our services stay up. So we integrate with PagerDuty there. And like I said, you know, yes, data scientists own this in production and they own production support <coughs> asterisk. It really means that they get paid simultaneously. And we try to express a contract with them that is, it is a data scientist on that team's responsibility to help triage the problem, which I think has one, one big benefit of this is that if it's something they already know about, like the ETL pipeline failed, then they have more context about what might be going on in the system. Beyond that, it's also useful for that team to understand what is working or not working and how frequently that system is failing because if it's something that is specific to that team and that particular application, then it provides motivation for them to simultaneously improve that and work on it. But the platform team, particularly the operative development platform team, is there to help debug and actually make sure the service is up and running as quickly as possible. But we work in collaboration with data scientists to make sure that that happens. So I described this, this way that we function, how we're organized. I described some of these tools that we play. And a nice self-serving question is what works well. And I think that one of the things that works really well about the way Stitch Fix is organized, the way data scientists have autonomy and ownership, is that I think people mostly feel very engaged and satisfied with their jobs. They feel like they can do their jobs in the way that they need to. As a data platform engineer, I certainly feel that way. I don't feel like I'm 
fill in some data sources for someone else to do all the fun things with. I feel like I'm trying to understand data scientists' workflow and building the right tools for them. What are the challenging parts of this sort of organization? Well, <laughs> that bottom blog post that I mentioned, engineers should not write ETL. When I first read it, I was scandalized. Scandalized. And part of the reason was that I had seen situations in which there were poorly maintained data systems. And data was a mess, it was all over the place. And when I heard this system described, I was like, your data has got to be all over the place. How do you all collaborate? How do you all understand what each other are doing? How, like, how do you begin to even think about organizing this? And this is where I then point back to that slide way at the beginning of the talk so long ago, uh, where I said, hey, there's this horizontal data science team. And we'll talk about a sub-team on it. Um, around the same time that I joined, a woman named Laura joined, and she is now leading the analytics engineering team. Analytics engineering is building a dimensionally model data warehouse, and they are unifying, solidifying, and just sort of providing core data sources that are easier to use. And a lot of this ends up being for business partners, so we have uh, Looker set up, set up on top of that now for business partners to be able to access and look at. Some data scientists, I think, will end up using this, and I'm sure the patterns and ideas that they share around, hey, this is what a dimension table is, for example, will be really useful and beneficial to the entire data science team. Um, yeah, and <laughs> I, when I read that blog post in Engineering Should Not Write PTL, um, I immediately invited Jay Mag, Jeff Magnuson, to be on an ETL panel at a conference that I was helping organize because I thought he was just such a rabble rouser. <laughs> and now that I looked at him, he's like, I'm pretty sure you weren't going to work here. I thought you were definitely never going to work here. You're so mad about that blog post. <laughs> so that's really all I have to say about how we do data science and statistics. We're really talking about statistics. Thank you. So if you like what you heard, we are hiring. I know you were wondering. Oh, uh, hi. So two more questions relevant to that. Uh, one is, did this system evolve from the personnel you had available? And the, the data scientists were just very well suited to building ETL as well? Uh, or was this more of a theory first thing? Uh, and second part is, how does it impact recruiting and hiring? Is it a specific kind of data science you look for now? that's maybe different from other companies in the Sure. So your first question, was this theory first or was it just the personnel available? This was very firmly rooted in Netflix's culture. So Eric Polson, head of algorithms and analytics, and Jeff Magnuson, head of data platform, and Brad, Herbert Lassay now. <laughs> um, they all came from Netflix, and Netflix is very deep in the autonomy or ownership view of the world. And so that definitely translated immediately into how Eric, Fred, J. Mag wanted to define how algorithms analytics work. Second question how does this now impact the types of data scientists we will look at and look for? It really depends team by team. And when I say, so I think the original conception of autonomy and ownership was an individual owns a capability. And that is not a very reliable or robust human system, right? We want teams to own capabilities. And maybe an individual leads its design and its implementation, but we want duplication of understanding and ownership. So that's one aspect of it, and I think that transition from having an individual on a capability to teams owning it has turned into in hiring a little bit, uh, a little bit more gray area where you think of okay, we're building this team, they're gonna, like we're going to build it with one person that has like high staff skills and not a strong programming skills, or we'll build it with someone who has built a lot of production services and their statistics are strong enough, but like. They're not one of our you know, PhDs in Bayesian statistics, and you know, you know what I'm saying. Um, 
So I think that this is transition, but we still very much expect full stack data scientists. And definitely, I think people that are immediately successful are ones that have had more experience with owning capabilities on them. Because it not only, I think the challenging thing is that when we talk about owning capabilities, it requires product management sense, it requires analytical sense, and it requires engineering sense. But what people actually do day to day, like are they doing more inference? They're running a bunch of AP tests on all those systems. Are they doing analysis where they need to understand statistics really well and be able to communicate that about the business partners? Those are all different skill sets. So I think there's a lot of opportunities for different types of data scientists because I think there are different types in the world. But people that tend to be successful tend to be a bit more experienced and uh, really excited about autonomy and ownership and not overwhelmed by the idea of it. Any questions? Yes. Yeah, um, the first thing I wanted to say that I think you have like a noble goal and like, like, like the core principles are like sound and I know it's not easy to set this up, but uh, it seems that there were some successes. Along the lines of my question is more about kind of the tiny details of, of your implementation. Like for example, when you talk about a data scientist setting up the service, does this mean they define the API that's going to be like interact with the product? Do they define like how it's going to be cached or it, it, all of the like pre-processing and meet like those like devil in the details for all of the API that runs in production are like data scientists are expected to do all of this? So I would say that data scientists are expected to own the ETL pipelines that generate things that get served. When it comes to defining the APIs and what is interacting with the engineering team most commonly, it'll be a mix of the data science team, the engineering team that they're integrating with, defining what goes in that API. And often this turns into, yeah, so I mean, I think, I think the the producer and the consumer come up with a contract that's mutually okay. And often someone from the data platform team might be there to help with the data science side. Or they'll come to us and say, hey, this is what we thought. Does this make sense? Does this look good? I think that happens much more frequently when we're doing things like we're rewriting our AB testing system right now. And so that, what AB testing looks like and how we integrate with engineering that way ends up being subtle and tricky and takes more discussion. And so often the platform will get integrated in those conversations, but we try to help and then that's hand off. And so maybe we're there to help set up the system, but what we want is data scientists when they're running their experiments to be able to define their experiments without us having to intervene, run whatever experiments they need. So we think about that, the long-term implications of trying to minimize handoff between platform and data scientists. Other questions? So you mentioned something about the uh, summarization format that you have to describe uh, Some, the models. Summarization-like format that you have to describe the models when they're uh, produced. Did you evaluate any more open source, more standard uh, ways of describing those, or, or for your specific case, what did the uh, kind of do? So all of all of our systems are built on relatively open source things, and I think. JSON communication of APIs is pretty standard for web services. I'm curious about the new analytics engineering team. What do they do on a day to day basis? Do they write ETL? How do you define what their scope is? Yes, they write ETL and they write. So the way that it's organized is that kind of like the verticals where we have clients filing ops, there's currently I think one engineer for each of those, except if we're hiring for client. Hiring, hiring, hiring. Um, <laughs> and they are responsible for taking the core tables and trying to understand what core tables lots of data scientists use and the business needs from our business partners that need some reporting on top of that. Figure out what those core tables should look like, figure out what the dimensions should look like, figure out what needs to be derived dimensions for reporting and building those. And so they build out ETL patterns. And we're hoping that their job evolves too so that they have 
they, they communicate what best practices are and what best ETL practices, but what best ETL practices exist. And so when I'm thinking about how the system for tracking changes in ETL is going to work, they're my best first customer, right? Like they're building core tables, they're extremely good at ETL and engineering, extremely build it, good at building evolvable data schemas, analyzable data schemas, and they end up being good practice teams. And so every time I'm like, oh, engineers don't write ETLs. Well, except this analytics engineering team, which is to me honestly a relief that we have that like I think organizations should have a sort of rigor around core tables that they do reporting output. Does that answer your question, Alpha? Yeah. Great. I think we've got time for one more question. Great. <laughs> Uh, related to the, some of the earlier comments around full stack data scientists, uh, do you find that like sort of the end-to-end -end ownership causes problems when like people leave the company, or uh, how do you deal with those issues? Yeah, I think it certainly causes <clears throat> problems when only one person owns it. One of the things that I think is a direction that most teams are moving is thinking about incentivizing teamwork on ownership. I think there was a common misconception that the way that you got promoted is that you own more capabilities. And so you just like slowly accumulate this thing where like you're the only person that knows it. And that's a bad incentive structure for us to have because then people individually own things. And so we're moving to a world where there's more incentive in professional development to own things as teams and have that team be responsible for it. And so I think absolutely there are challenges if a single person owns a capability and they leave the company, who, who has all this expert knowledge about it, right? When you do data analysis, you begin to understand the data, the models in a really intimate way, and it's not something that's easily transferable, right? You can spend a week writing, just like continuously writing about a model, I don't think you can communicate enough about it. Yeah, so more, more, more team encouragement of ownership. Thanks, it's definitely a thing that we're working on. Thank you.